that can take this on. Uh, this isn't this isn't one size fits all. And um, for those other teams that are not the Giants, as long as you can compete for comp uh, compete for championships, then you're in a good place. So, uh, Phil, tell our fans, um, how did you get involved in the game of basketball? Uh, you were born in uh, Pennsylvania, but talk about your early career, how, your journey. How do you get into uh, uh, in basketball? You played uh, um, basketball too. You were a point guard, and before you got, you got into coaching. So, talk about your early early life and how you got into basketball. That's a really great question. Uh, brings a smile to my face. Uh -huh. um, I was I was raised in Philadelphia, Southwest Philadelphia, and I was affectionately a playground rat. So in the spring, I played baseball. In the summer, I played baseball. Uh, in the fall, I played football. And in the winter, if we were good enough and we could find a gym, then we would get into a gym. But basketball was kind of like a seasonal activity. I moved to the suburbs. And when I went to the suburbs, uh, everything centered around our school and our CYO team. And I was 12 or 13 years old, and I met three guys who were my coaches in the game of basketball. And I was blown away, just blown away by their ability to reach 12 and 13 and 14 year olds and to have them push us in the same direction to win championships. That's when I knew in the ninth grade, I knew that I wanted to coach. I wanted to teach and I wanted this game, which I think is a beautiful game. I think basketball is a societal experiment that does not discriminate. You can go to Philadelphia and play. You can go to the suburbs and play. You could be male or female. You could be black or white. You could be rich or poor. You could be an international student, mm -hmm. but you can find a game and you go into that game and you share the ball, you share the responsibilities and you build these relationships through the game of basketball. That's what I was able to do. Uh, I went on to St. Joe's prep. I played at St. Joe's prep and had a Wonderful, wonderful experience, always impacted by my coaches, who I considered to be teachers, not 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 just a coach as a title, but they were teachers of the game of life and the game of basketball. I went to Widener in Chester, played Division three basketball all the time in the summer. I was trying to enhance. And embrace my opportunities to eventually coach when I came out of college. I was the JV coach at Cardinal O'Hara High School in Springfield, Pennsylvania. Uh, I left there. I went back to Widener University. I was an assistant coach at Widener and left there. And then I was fortunate enough at a young age to be the head coach at Bishop Kenrick High School in Norristown, Pennsylvania. Um, and at that moment in time, I treated that basketball program as if it was a college basketball program. I was fully invested 350 days a year. Uh, everything that I did was to make our program better and to have coached in the Philadelphia Catholic League, which is what I wanted. I wanted to be in the Philadelphia Catholic League. And I had that opportunity. Um, and then I got an itch maybe six or seven years into my time at Kenrick. I wondered if my ideas would flow into college. Mm -hmm. And I went to St. Joseph's as a restricted earning. So I was still teaching school restricted earnings. I went there after school and then I became a head assistant coach at St. Joseph's for 10 years. And um, to have done this for the, obviously the overwhelming portion of my career was in Philadelphia where I was born and raised. I could do it with family. I could do it with my friends. Uh, I, I am, I am forever grateful uh, for the memories and the relationships. And then to have the opportunity to, to go to Michigan and see what big looks like, right? I went, I was in small, I went to big and I'm thankful that I had that opportunity. And now I'm grateful to be back in Philadelphia and I'm out here trying to make a difference. Wow. One thing that you said was that you looked at your coaches like they were teachers so my question to you, especially because athletes' mental health has been one of the biggest topics in sports as over the last few years, what did you do to teach these athletes not only about the game of basketball, but in life? I think that anybody that gets into coaching and or teaching 
we are responsible to build one-on-one -on -one relationships. So I worked really, really hard at relationships. And that was not just with players. That could be with managers. That could be with support staff. I wanted everybody to know I don't have the answers, but I have the, the heart and the mind, the ears and the eyes that can I help? Can I help? I didn't get it all right, but I wanted, I wanted to be able to help. I think that in dealing with young people, less is more. So when somebody would say to me, a young coach, will, I'll meet with a young coach. We lost you, Phil. Yeah. Uh oh, yeah, he froze up. Uh -huh. Hopefully, we get that back and working real shortly. Yeah, but yeah, so so far so good here. Definitely an inspiration. You know, I love talking to coaches for this reason. Yeah, because you're you, mean, a, you used to be an uh, athlete yourself, so exactly. And one thing I focused on was having a good relationship with my coaches, and I've noticed that. The ones I was closer to, I, you know, I knew what they wanted more and I could get that, they could get that out of me. Whereas coaches I wasn't as close to, it was definitely a, a mental toll. You know, you didn't know what they wanted and it always felt like you were on the bottom compared to everybody else. And I think it's, especially when you're a youth athlete, more responsibility of the coach to talk to those players because the players are young. They're, they're, they're learning so many things at one time. Um, and I can imagine it's the same thing in college and, you know, even the pros are, you're taking on something completely new all the time. Uh, so hearing him talk about the importance of one-on-one -on -one relationships with his players is definitely meaningful. Yeah. We have him back. Yeah. And yeah. yeah the idea of, of uh, like the rules were limited, but the foundations, mm -hmm. like my foundations were respect, respect your family name, respect your teammates. Respect your teammates' differences. Some guys are loud and 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 want to be center of attention. Other guys want to be reclusive and pulled back. That's all right. That's all right. Uh, respect your opponents. Respect the game itself. Respect your coaches. But also expect to be respected. Like you shouldn't be treated differently because you're a, the sixth man or the starter. That That's not fair. That's not right. The second thing, the second pillar was communication. I wanted, I wanted to be on a basis where player to player communication, coach to player relate, uh, communication, coach to family communication. A lot of coaches want to pull back from families. I don't get that. These, the people that raise them, love them, love their players. We want to grow as coaches to love your son, your daughter. And I'm going to need your help in, to do, in, in doing that. And then the third thing was daily improvement. If every day, everybody out there watching this, listening, every day, I ask you to take it, give yourself a test, a little quiz, and ask yourself this question. Did I get better today as a person? Did I get better today as a player, as an athlete, as an accountant, as a salesman? as a CEO, as a truck driver, did I get better? And then the third thing is, what knowledge did I pick up today? Really, am I a better student because of, and then you fill in the blank. And right before you close your eyes, head on the pillow, answer those questions. Three for three, you had a spectacular day. If you didn't get any of those things done, not a better person, not a better student, not a better player, or we'll fill in the job title, then you know what the beauty is? Put it to rest, get after it again tomorrow. Because you get a chance every single day to get better. Can't stay the same. Yep. You know, yep. I've played sports my sorry, Nathan, I just want to add on to that. Played sports my entire life and 
really there's only two coaches I could point out and look at and say they really try to connect with me on a personal level. And the ones I didn't are the ones where I struggled, both playing and, and mentally playing. You know, I was never the best athlete on the field. And I've always known that, but I wanted to be there. But when, you know, you had the coaches and teammates who didn't try to build those connections, it made it a lot harder, put a lot more pressure on me compared to when, you know, even if you don't perform as good, if you have a coach who was willing to talk to you after the game, you know, willing to go beyond the game with that conversation, it, it really helps a lot relieve that that's pressure. Beautiful, that's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful statement. Beyond the game, beyond the game. If anybody out there is just coaching – or thinks of themselves as the coach, I would just ask you to reconsider that because we are teacher coaches, right? And we are in love with the game that we are teaching and we want to grow our young people to have that same love. But they have to know that you care in order to give you everything that they have. And Shout they have, out to you have open communication, meaningful communication, not, you know, hang in there, work hard, and no, nah, I don't go for all that. Hmm. Shout out to Coach Davis and Coach Wydell. You guys have really changed my entire life and part of the reason why I'm here. Hmm. Okay. Well well said. That's uh, that's amazing. And uh, Phil, talk about uh, – I want to get your th thoughts. Tell our fans about Widener College. Uh, what was it like – I was you played there, but what was it like coming back there as a coach and coaching at all mater and uh, talk about that experience. Well, we had a terrific team when I was at Widener, and that would have been 70, 1978. We ended up playing for the national championship in Division Three. I was teaching school and driving down to Widener, um, and C. Allen Rowe was a small college Hall of Fame-level coach. He had great insight. But to be on the college level and to be on a team that was winning and – all the little things that you don't think about when you say, I want to coach, you know, how are you going to approach uh, the break between semesters? How are you going to, how are you going to deal with a road game? What's your travel look like? Uh, how about the responsibility, particularly in division three of players filling out financial aid forms and always recognizing that these young guys were playing basketball, representing their family, representing their school, and they were paying a bill. You know, twice a year they were paying a, a bill, not as steep as the bills are today for higher education. Um, but the biggest thing about the experience at Widener was team. And I see it today. I see it when I when I communicate with those players, they'll say I was in touch with this teammate, I was in touch with that teammate. And there's this also a a little bit of frustration, anxiety in all of us. When we say, hey, I haven't heard from, from that guy, or I don't know what my teammate is up to. Like, they weren't your teammate just for four years, or they weren't your teammate for just 35 games. Really, they were your teammate for life. And uh, I often sit and say, I must do better reaching back to my players and, and my teammates and letting them know we were there for each other on the court. We have to be there for each other off the court now later in life. You got to coach under Juwan Howard, uh, and I had to step up multiple times and play a pretty big role. Can you talk about that and what that meant for you? Well, first of all, uh, the opportunity that Juwan Howard presented me was extraordinary because Michigan only pursues excellence. And when we went out there, knowing that Juwan Howard had never been a Division One head coach, it gave me some freedoms to not, 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 I did not have to be uh, listened to on everything I said, but I needed to be heard. And it was a, it was a terrific experience. It was a sacrifice to be away from my family. My wife stayed in, in the Philadelphia area and I went out there and rented a condo. Um, Philadelphia like flows through my veins. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I missed that. The opportunity at a big school and then the opportunity, you make a really great point because for so long I was the head coach. So I was making the decisions 
and probably didn't do enough leaning on others. Yeah. But to know in the situations two or three times where, where they were leaning on me, uh, I was prepared. Uh, I was less anxious than I was at, when I was the head coach at St. Joseph's. Uh, but the but the key ingredient was I wanted it to be about the players. I didn't want it to be the, about me on a some kind of redemption tour or anything like that. Uh, I wanted it to always be about the players and the experience that they had. So I worked I worked overtime overtime to make sure that I gave them the best version of myself. Great pickup by you, by the way. Yeah, speaking of speaking of Jawan Howard, he's now the assistant coach for Brooklyn Nets. Uh, so now he's going to get a uh, He's back in the NBA now coaching. And uh, it's going to be fun to see him uh, back in the NBA rings and uh, coaching with the Nets and with uh, Jordy Fernandez. And uh, spe like speaking of that, though, Talk talk about that. Like, what do you think? Uh, what do you think that the coaching staff uh, with Jawan Howard and Jordy Fernandez? What, what are your thoughts on that for Brooklyn? Well, I think it's a fascinating league. I think it's the best league in 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 the world, um, with the best players. And so when I look at those games, I really focus on what is it? April, May, and June. I I think the the playoffs are extraordinary. I think during the season, it's the individual players that you watch for. I want to see what Steph Curry is going to do. And I, I want to see the growing uh, superstars, these young kids that are, that, you know, Victor, what, 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 what did he add to his game? So in Brooklyn, I think if you look at their roster, you go, oh, tough stretch here. I mean, particularly when you are, are in the East, and you got to deal with Boston, you got to deal with Philly, you got to deal with New York, you got to deal with Milwaukee, got to deal with Miami, and on and on and on. Um, Juwan Howard loves to teach. And he is going to be in a position with a lot of young players to be able to teach the game of basketball, teach them not only about the NBA game on the floor, but he's going to teach them to be a pro off the floor. It'll be an extraordinary journey to, to watch from afar. Just before I shout out to my coaches, and I want to know, have there have there ever been any players that you've felt extra connected to and stayed in touch with over the years? You know, you coached for a while. You've probably seen a lot of these guys grow up uh, into their lives. And how do those connections kind of like have a rewarding feeling? Well, when I recruited, I would look the family and the young person in the eye. And I would say to them, I have no interest in you coming to play for me. I have no interest in you coming to play for me for one year, two years, three years, four years, whatever it is, whether you transfer or whether you you're good enough to go to the NBA early. I am only interested in uh, forming a lifetime relationship. So here's what I would say to every one of those players. When you get married, I have a seat at the table, okay? I can't dance, but I'll dance at your wedding. Hmm. Uh, the birth of a child, the signing of a contract, I want to be there to embrace you in moments of joy. On the flip side, I want to embrace you in moments of sorrow, a loss of a loved one, Maybe it, maybe you're misguided. You don't know. You don't have a direction in life. I demand that you make that call to me. Again, I may not be able to answer it. And any number of times I've gotten calls and players are down and out and they're looking for X amount of dollars and I, I don't have it. But I can at least listen I can hopefully talk them through formulating a plan. And to be honest with you, the question is so good in that the names that run through my head and my heart are not the ones I stay in touch with. They're the ones that have gotten away, that I haven't done a good enough job. And to think that 
I coached them for 120 games. I, there has to be a relationship. And I take great pains in trying to find those players. Now, some, some maybe were disappointed in their playing time or some thought I didn't tell them the truth about, you know, what they should expect or, or whatever. Um, I will say this forever. My, my 24 years at St. Joe's and the 10 years as assistant. So 34 years on that campus, the greatest day for me was graduation. And I would go there and I would celebrate with their families and with the players because that was mission accomplished. They did it. They graduated, but we did talk about it in recruiting. So, um, Memories and relationships, when people say, what did you take away from St. Joseph's and what did you take away from Michigan? Memories and relationships, not individual games, not trophies, not accolades, um, not sneakers, not gear. It was all about the memories and the relationships. All right. Very well said. Thank you. Yeah, speaking of, speaking of recruiting, uh, obviously we know one player – uh, uh, Rob Hartorn from the uh, from the events. He he's he has a great story, and and then you recruited uh, Delonte West, uh, Jameer Nelson, Dwayne Jones. It can go on, but talk about Rob Rob's story because uh, I want our fans to know about him because I've I obviously we we met him in person a couple times, and he's uh, he does great in the community. Also, talk about Rob real quick. Rob Hartorn uh, came to St. Joseph. He was a decorated high school athlete. Um, and he, he really didn't have as much of a direction. So he chose to be a cheerleader. He was a male cheerleader at St. Joseph's. Uh, and I would watch him when they were practicing and he could do things athletically that just made you scratch your head, including dunk the ball any which way. So after his sophomore year, I said, you should try out for the team. We had an open tryout you should try out for the team. And he made the team as a junior and I uh, came back as a senior and he was on great, great, great teams. I, I don't know the record, but probably somewhere in the vicinity of 60 and 60 and eight over two years. Um, and what Rob did was he allowed his energy to permeate everybody. Yeah. He was an enthusiastic guy. He was a noisy guy. He was, uh a great example of what we are all responsible to do. When we lead an activity, we must find each person's strengths and let them play to their strengths. Not everybody's created equal. And Rob was the enthusiastic, energetic. He also was one who could take coaching. So if I had a moment of anger or I wanted to blow off some steam, I could direct it at Rob. He knew it wasn't personal. And like of all of the guys, all of the guys over all those years that I've coached, the one that I talk to the most is Rob. And people need to know this. This is a young guy who has ended every conversation with me over the last 15 years with, I love you, coach. Mm -hmm. That's not a male thing. Like we males don't do that real easily. And he has taught me that. And then I can go out and share that. Uh, and then the, his idea of, 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 or his recognition that he owed the community has been heartwarming. He, he's a very, very, very special guy. Yeah. And speaking of, speaking of St. Joseph, you, you, you got, you were able to coach with Jim Boyle, John Griffin, and, uh, at some point you were named at the 14 coach in school history. And, uh, talk about St. Joseph, St. Joseph's college alone itself and the history and, and the program and, and then uh, and coaching there too. Well, I thought the greatest thing about St. Joseph's is that excuses didn't factor into anything that you did. You weren't allowed to say, well, we're a small school or we're this, or we're in Philadelphia and there's five other division one schools. No, you, you were able to pursue that quote unquote as a family business. And, um, Back to the earlier question about the NIL, they're they're making this now a corporate world. That's the family business at St. Joseph's, and I, and I just the passion 
uh, the ability to connect because it was a small school. You didn't have to go up onto a tower and say, you know, I'm the coach and I, I, I can figure this out on my own. No, I had a lot of support. I had a lot of family. Um, but most especially, most especially, Don DeJoy, the athletic director, is one of the best in the business. Um, and to have had the opportunity to work with him for St. Joseph's. Uh, the other thing is that St. Joseph's allowed me to be me. Mm -hmm. I'm not a, I don't mean that I'm politically incorrect, but I wanted to do a TV show a certain way. They allowed that. Uh, I wanted to have open practices. Anybody could walk into our gym. They allowed me to do that. Um, I wanted to schedule a certain way. We went places that most people wouldn't go on the road and play, being from the Atlantic 10. Mm -hmm. And they allowed that. And most especially, they supported the players who all came with different academic backgrounds, social backgrounds, and they supported that. So. Again, memories and relationships. Would I like to have ended my career at St. Yeah, uh, but that doesn't take away my memories and my relationships. You talked about uh, St. Joe's letting you do things the way you wanted to. And one thing I've talked to a lot of athletes about is their pregame routines and how some of them have more strict rules on what they can and can't do. Uh, my question to you is what was your routine as a coach? You, like I said, you hear a lot about the players pregame routines, but I want to know how you're preparing for a game and how you're preparing your players to get ready for the game. Well, there's two different ways really, to be honest with you, home and away. So if we were at home, I would stay away because I was nervous about not whether or not we would win or lose, but did I properly prepare them for the challenge that night? So I would stay away. I would stay at home. And I had a certain routine at home. I would read a little bit. Uh, I would actually read a lot. I would um, uh, say my prayers. I would get my workout in. And then I was always punctual in getting to the arena an hour and a half before the game. And then when I was in the arena, I had a certain format that I, that I followed, uh, rereading my scouting report, making my pregame notes, um, making sure that the script was set for how we were going to play that night. Um, go to the locker room at a certain time, talk a certain times, talk for a certain length. But that was all uh, planned out. On the road, we would get up and we would shoot. We would not shoot at home. Like you hear these people talk about shoot arounds and walkthroughs. We wouldn't do that at home because that would disrupt their day. So if they had to be in class, they had to be in class. If this was a normal time that they rested, they needed to rest. On the road, we wanted to get them up, make sure they ate breakfast, got there, did some shooting, come back, uh, rest or study hall, then uh, watch film, and same thing, get to the arena an hour and a half before the game. So uh, a lot of alone time was best for me on game day. I don't want to. I don't want to get others nervous because I was a little bit uptight. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read off your resume. You had a, obviously I said it early in the show. You had a great career, coaching career, over 400 <laughs> career wins. Uh, you you were a, you had three Atlantic tour, ten Atlantic ten tournaments, uh, four Atlantic ten uh, regular season tournaments, and also coach of the year, AP coach of the year, Naismith coach of the year, a couple of awards, and and talk about. Some of your best moments, uh, Phil, uh, and uh, tell our fans some of your best moments you had in your career, and 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 your resume speaks for itself. Well, I've already alluded to. There were two days each year that it was um, very special, and that was graduation. I thought that was a really big deal, and then the other one was our Christmas charity. We collected money. We bought gifts, we wrapped gifts, we delivered gifts and the homes to families in West Philadelphia. They they were they were highlights. Um to me, the games are a little bit of a blur. Like if you say Villanova, yeah. I mean, we won at Villanova, we beat Villanova at the Palestra. Um to me, it was it was 
you you made a great statement there about moments like what were some of those those moments and and they all center around people like when i was a high school coach at bishop kenrick high school uh centered around a young guy by the name of johnny custer who was five foot four and was big enough as a player to be all catholic uh the experiences at uh saint joseph's at michigan all revolve around uh players so i, I don't have any regrets i um and I, do, I don't really have, well, someone has, has asked me before, well, what were your top three wins? I I don't know. I, I thought every win was so great. Um, obviously, the championships are a really big deal because they are, they are, they verify how hard you've worked as a group. Um, but there's always that pang. There's always that one more game. And one more opportunity. So again, the memories are what resonates from my career. The memories and the people, not individual games. Yeah, that's that's well said right there. If you could have one moment that you look at now and just think, I wish I did something differently, what would that moment be? Mm-hmm. Uh, great question. Um, I, I'll just saying that I don't remember games. I, I do have this game in my head because I messed it up. Um, uh, I want to do the years right. 2005, we were in Cincinnati playing for the Atlantic 10 championship. This is a team that was after the great team. So Delonte West was in the NBA. Jameer Nelson was in the NBA. Um, People had counted us out. We changed our style of play. We we rode on the shoulders of Pat Carroll, who was a returning starter, just a great shooter, was the player of the year in the Atlantic 10. We battled our way to the championship game in Cincinnati against Xavier. So really, it was a road game. Um, we had always played baseline defense in one way. And, and that moment in time, I didn't trust it. And I called a different defense than our normal defense. And Xavier made a great play and cut back to her. And we fouled a guy who made a layup and they made it. And we lost the championship by two points. Uh, that was my fault because all along, I believe in trust and you, we didn't do a whole lot. I, I mean, we did what we had to do X and O wise. And I had to trust it. It was good enough until it wasn't good enough in that moment in time. And that was my fault. And that's the one that, that sticks with me. That sticks with me. How do you handle the locker room after a moment like that? Uh, you have to stay, you have to stay consistent. You, you, I was always short in the locker room after the game, win or lose, because everybody's exhausted and everybody could be into their own feelings. And all that happens with coaches that go real long in a locker room um, you, you, you say something and it's, it's the wrong use of the word at that point in time. Uh, the biggest deal in those locker rooms is this. We're not leaving here until all of you are whole. And the only way you can all be whole is if you have each other's back. So don't let a guy wander into the shower and, and be in there for 30 minutes don't 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 let anybody in here uh not walk out with their head high of what of all that you have accomplished i that's what i've used at the end of almost every season and the time to thank you and the time for um you know what's next that will come but for this moment in time the only thing that matters is that we leave this locker room like a fist and that's where you have your power. You have your power in a fist. You do not have a power in an open hand. And that's people going off and doing their own thing or going to their families. Now we have to, we have to leave here united, just like we walked in here united. Yeah, speaking, yeah, speaking of coaches, um, you guys went up against when we were coaching, went up against uh 
other uh, great coaches in in the in, in the game of college basketball. And what was it like going against uh, Rick Pitino and Jim Beheim, who are both close friends with you too? Right. Um. Well, you separate it when you get on the court, mm -hmm. right? You, you, when you get on the court, it's my five guys against your five guys. Um, you want for their success. You want for their success, except for that 40 minutes when they're playing you. And they want for your success. Um, I think anytime you cloud your personal with your professional, it, it can be challenging. So I've had opportunity on another bench to have my son on the other bench. When I was coaching St. Joseph's, he was coaching Rutgers. When I was at Michigan, he was at Penn State. Uh, the the um, the challenge is both those guys that you mentioned are in the Hall of Fame. John Cheney's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Jay Wright's in the Hall of Fame. These are my friends. But you want to measure yourself against the best. That's what I felt when we were playing Rick Pitino or playing Jim Beheim or John Calipari or, yeah, those guys are my friends. And we're going to be friends at the end of this game. Yeah. Uh, but for this moment in time, it's just like when you went into the backyard and you played against your cousin or your next door neighbor or your brother, if you have a brother, you want to win, you know, and, and you're going to, a lot of times in the backyard, you want to cut a corner to cheat and, and win. But in those occasions, um, you're thankful for the you're thankful for the friendship, but you're thankful for the opportunity to, to compete. Mm -hmm. I kind of said it before, but in a very different circumstance, sports are always evolving and that comes with rule changes on the court. Are there any rules that you'd either change or add to college basketball that you think would be beneficial? Well, it's not change or add, but it would be, I think that, that the college game has to become less physical. I think it's way too physical. Uh, that leads to, to discrepancies in officiating, you know, night after night after night. I think we should make it a scoring game. I think it should be, a, it's a beautiful team game. And that, that should be uh, included. I think allowing the, uh, allowing the coach to call timeout, it's a minor detail, but it's a, it, 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 it's a big deal. Um, but I, there's nothing dramatic that I would change about the game. I'm not in favor of changing the lane. I'm not in favor of changing the shot clock. Uh, I think it's it's a spectacular game, uh, and I think the referees do a really good job. But it is challenging when it's there's such a variation in the physicality. Let's eliminate physicality and make it a skill game, which is what it's supposed to be. Pretty good mindset. Pretty good idea. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, talk about uh now the current Michigan basketball team. Uh, what are, what are your thoughts on Dusty May, the the head coach, and what do you like about this this year's team? Well, I don't really know uh, Dusty. I had uh, brief conversations with him when I was leaving. He was coming in. Uh, wonderful, wonderful guy. Uh, I was very impressed with the idea that the focus was going to be on the players and it wasn't about, I've been to the final four and he, he wasn't walking around touting his own record. Um, and I think that this Michigan team is going, is very similar to the now the new environment in college basketball and that um, it's a new team. I don't really know them. I mean, uh, Danny Wolf is there. I know I knew Danny, we recruited him before he went to Yale. Will Cheddar is still there, a beautiful young guy. Namari Burnett is still there, a beautiful young guy who, look, they took a lot of blows last year. We were not a good team. They took a lot of blows, and and I, I, I'll root for them. Uh, I'm excited. I don't know, I don't know Dusty's staff, um, but I know the people around the program. I know the, the fans 
uh, around the program, and I wish I wish them only great success. Speaking of evolving, analytics have become a huge part, a huge part of sports over the last few years. And I'm a baseball guy, so I really see it the most in baseball. I'm not as knowledgeable in it as in any other sports, but a lot of guys that I've talked to, managers specifically in baseball, they all have a different concept of the analytics. You know, you, you hear the younger guys, they grew up with it, so they understand it more than the guys who've been coaching for a while. You've been coaching for a while, so how have you developed analytics into your style of coaching? Well, I, I would probably say, uh, I believe I believe in the numbers, but I'm not, but I don't do a deep dive into the numbers, right? So I'm really interested in how a team and how a player are performing over their last five games, your team and the other team. I'm really interested in the, and it, maybe it's not analytical, but it's situational. What's a team going to do in the last two minutes? Who, who are they going to go to? Um, the numbers fascinated me and the, the information that was gathered fascinates me. I'm a crazy, crazy Philadelphia Philly fan. And mm -hmm. they spout these numbers off on the broadcast. I scratch my head and say, I'm not exactly sure what it is that, 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 that means, um, you know, you're a baseball guy. So X of velocity has become a major, major thing. And uh, used to be, it was a hard hit ball, but now it's got a mileage on it or miles per hour um so i believe that it's here to say it's it's look it's part of the evolution because we're a more analytically more driven society so why shouldn't that go to why shouldn't that go to sport i mean we have a presidential election coming up and days before that election analytically they they're going to know who the winner is right they're going to know that because if x and y and z happens and the people turn out and and then if they're wrong it's because one of those numbers was skewed because or maybe it rained torrential rainstorm in philadelphia and the turnout was x instead of y um so part of society it has to be part of sport Yeah, so uh, tell our fans, um, what's when did you start helping out Serena with her Cylon Wellness uh, uh, program foundation and also helping out Jermaine Jones? And uh, obviously, we're part of the helping out with the foundation. So talk about your involvement in, in the, the foundation with Serena and then also with Jermaine and we're doing these events for the kids also. Uh, X number of years ago, I was at a dinner, a friend of mine, his wife was being honored. And I remembered going in to make sure that I saw her, congratulate her. And then Sister Bernadette started to speak. Yeah. And I felt like she was speaking directly to me. And I sat down and I was mesmerized by the work that they were doing. And I have a brother who was struggling and I said, they can help my brother. Mm -hmm. So I took it upon myself to make an appointment and I drove down there and met the people from Silwam and uh, they did, they helped my brother and my pledge to them was, how can I help you? And so if they can put my name on, if we can enhance the celebration for Jermaine, if we can improve the basketball outreach, where we're trying to reach as many young people as we can. Um, I, I believe that that Serena and the people at Silwam are heroes. Heroes are everyday people who do extraordinary things for people oftentimes that they'll never meet. Um, I like to be around heroes and I don't, I do not consider myself heroic in this effort but I consider the people that are there every single day and have the highest of highs and the lowest of lows in dealing with the clients. Uh, they're the heroes. If I can support a hero, then that's a good day for me. 
It's very meaningful. Thank you. Another question that I have is about you. Uh, I want to get to know you. Besides the game of basketball, what things are you now doing in your daily life that, you know, the average person wouldn't know about? Well, one is I'm a lunatic about the Phillies. So I watch every pitch. I, uh, I yell at the TV on every play. Um, I'm just so excited for this, this uh, March into Red October. I hope it lasts a whole month. I think it's great for the city when that happens. Um, I'm very structured in terms of making sure that I get out of, because my office is now in my house, I have to get out of, and I'm, I'm dedicated to an hour a day of, of fitness. And then when I'm out and about, what I'm trying to do is make a difference. That's the name of my company. P&J Enterprises make a difference. And I want to do corporate talks. I want to do school district talks. I want to speak to athletic departments, not as the coach, but as a guy that has some themes and some ideas on how I'm going to make you a coach. And that every organization needs a leader. If they want to call that leader coach, if they want to call him CEO, if they want to call it director, that's fine. We're the same. So I am out exploring many, many, many opportunities and would welcome opportunities uh, prior to, to getting on with you guys. Uh, I had a family owned business, 50 employees, and we're setting up an opportunity for me to come in. First, I want to learn about you. And then second of all, I want to share uh, with you. I'm hopeful to do some TV games. I'm not ready to do the biggest of the bigs and I'm not ready to say, 40 games a year. But if I could do 10 and be good enough to do 20 next year, that's my, that's my intention. But my make a difference, make a difference, whether it's through our podcast, which is going to be released in the next couple of days, whether it's uh, Instagram, I have Martelli minute on Instagram. It's just a thought that I wake up with every day. Um, LinkedIn, I, who, who knew that any of this was, was even possible, but um, I have to give back. That's the biggest thing. I want to give back to my community because the community has given me so much. Uh, Love that. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. Well said. Uh, before we let you go, uh, tell your fans how confident are you this year in your Philadelphia Phillies in the playoffs? Well, I'm a, I'm confident until Wheeler throws the first ball. And then I panic. <laughs> or, uh, uh, Schwar Schwarberg starts out with a. It, it, it's just, it's. But I will say this. Anybody that's in and around Broad and Spruce, I'm planning on being on on Broad Street in November. Okay, and I sure hope that there's a parade going by because. I'll look a little silly if they think I'm there for the early's mummer, mummer's parade. <laughs> I'm excited though. Yeah. And um, I saw a picture of you and Charlie Manuel on your Instagram and uh, talk, talk about this, the story of that. And then, um, and, and seeing uh, when, when Charlie Manuel managed the man, uh, Phillies, he had a uh, obviously great career managing. Uh, but talk, about, talk about Charlie Manuel. He's always been a very, all of the coaches, all the professional coaches in Philadelphia have always been very kind to myself and the, and the college basketball coaches. It's just a, it's a fraternity and they allowed us into their professional fraternity uh, to meet Charlie, to thank him for what he did for the city, to wish him well, because he, he's, you know, had a stroke and battling health issues. Um, that was at the Pennsylvania Derby. I was invited to attend the Pennsylvania Derby. Um, I don't know much about horses, but I was there with Brad Lidge and Charlie Manuel and myself. So um, he's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man who loves his time in Philadelphia and he loves his Phillies. So we, we were on common ground loving our Phillies. All right. So tell our fans where, where they can find you on social media. Uh, yeah, we have a, a, a website, 
P and J Enterprises. It's P and then the word and J. So it's Phil and Judy, my wife, Enterprises. Uh, dot com. Uh, I am on Twitter at uh, I don't even know what the Twitter handle is. Um, uh, if they put in Phil Martelli, they're going to find me. Yeah, Phil Martelli. Instagram, Instagram, Phil Martelli. Uh, LinkedIn is Phil Martelli. So we're in all the all those uh, different platforms. The business that I'm running is called Make a Difference corporate and school district talks uh, and just interested in feedback and leads and conversations. Um, my goal is to get into as many schools as I can, understanding that teachers and students, I can connect with them different, each in a different setting. Um, but I'm back here. I'm back. I'm back in Philadelphia and the biggest thing to emphasize is I'm back to make a difference. They can reach out, they can, they can hit an email, and I I respond to everything. And it's me. I don't I don't have a a proxy in any way, shape, or form. Would love to connect with as many organizations, businesses, and schools as I can. Okay, so there you have it, Phil Martelli. Uh, great great person, great college, uh, coaching career. Uh, former Michigan assistant coach and. Obviously, St. Joseph, and uh, what what a heck of a rec heck of a resume, and looking forward to doing more events with you, Phil. And uh, uh, thank you for joining the show, and uh, looking forward to seeing you in person with Serena and the rest of the crew. So thank you again. Thank you for including me, fellas. You were you were just terrific. Thank really, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye now.